Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Today in Title Town Packers podcast. My name is Griffin. You can follow me on Instagram at All Day Packers, and I'm joined, as always, by my good friend Braun, who you can follow on Instagram at Lambo.Leapers, and we are coming back to you with another podcast with another Packers therapy session, I'm afraid. The Packers lose another game. Back to back losses. They drop to 3 and 3 on the season. God, Braun, what are we going to do here? How are you? How am I, Griff? Not a lot of words, but. Um, a lot to discuss, again, because when we lose, there just always seems to be a lot to talk about, and I am not having a good life. <laughs> no, there's so, there's so much to talk about after a loss. It's like, when the Packers win, it feels so good on Sunday, but then, like, the rest of the week, we really don't have that much to talk about. On these podcasts, we don't have a lot to talk about. If the Packers would have won on Sunday against the Jets, we'd be on here spending 20 minutes probably talking about the uniforms and our thoughts on the throwback uniforms, which I imagine today we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on because the Packers lost, and there's so much to break down in terms of how terrible this football team is because, God, two weeks in a row now, I'm coming out of this game thinking, are we just not that good? Are we just not that good of a team? So if you if you want to hear two people just complain about the Packers for about an hour, stick around because that's what this show is going to be. Braun, this team, they're 3-3. Three and three. They look so, so average that it pains me. What is the state of the team right now? Yeah, Griff, let's break it down. And speaking of breaking down, that's what I'm doing. So, But overall... <laughs> uh, the New York Jets, Griff, what a sorry franchise to lose to. We have not lost to them since 2006, and that's the New York Jets, Griff. They're the worst team of all teams. They are the the God. laughing stock of, of our sport. I don't care what their record is. Them. Losing to the Jets, it, it can't get much worse than that in the NFL. <laughs> Just imagine if we lost to the Giants, too. Oh, we did, Braun. Last week we lost to the Giants. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, man, the Packers, they're not good. Oh, God. Yeah. Well, that's such a... And you know what's so funny? We lost to the Jets and the Giants. They're <laughs> terrible teams consistently. Bron, if... Do you remember after... I think it was after week three, I saw a bunch of people tweeting, and I saw a bunch of people posting as well about the Packers' upcoming quarterbacks before our game in Buffalo week eight. And it was... Our lineup goes... It's even more embarrassing in hindsight to think of it this way. But our lineup went... Brian Hoyer, who exited the game against New England, ended up being Bailey Zappi. Then Daniel Jones, and then Zach Wilson. And we go one and two in those three games. The only win... We went to overtime against Bailey Zappi, and now we've got Taylor Heineke coming up next week, and then we have to go play Josh Allen, and everyone's talking about how the Packers have a good chance of being 6-1 going into this game against Buffalo, and God, this is why you can't look ahead like that, because the Packers, they're so, oh, they're not good enough to beat Zach Wilson or Daniel Jones, and they have to go to overtime against Bailey Zappi. I have had a real reckoning in my my own mental health pertaining to the Green Bay Packers of how I think about this team because after week three if you just want to compare our mindsets between three weeks ago and now it's like god this team is just not that good is that really the case tell me it's not the case Braun. well Griff we all need a little Packers therapy I think it's so funny because we're we just beat the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and then you go and lose to these two teams it makes you really wonder what kind of team we are, but you're only as good as your last game and our last two. And then if you go back to that Patriots, the way we finished that game, man, we do not look good. But the good news is it is only week six, and we can't keep saying that every week. But right now we can keep saying that. It's only week three. It's only week four or five. It's only week six. It's only week 14, and the Packers have won five games. (laughs) Packers get blown out in week one. Matt LaFleur, we got to be better. The Packers... Week out a win in week two. We got to be better. The Packers win in week three. We got to be better. If the Packers lose their last two. We got to be better. Thanks, Matt. Do we, Matt? Do we have to be better? The good thing is that half the league sucks. I feel like half the league is three and three right now. Have you seen like yeah. the picture? Like it's literally like half the league is three and three, dude. And if they're not three and three, they're they're two and four. Um, there's four, just four not a lot two. of good teams. It's going all, yeah, there's not a lot of space. There's not a lot of space between these teams, especially record wise. It is so early. There are some of those teams. Now you start to look at the NFC. The Eagles are running away with it a little bit because they're six and zero and they're going into a bye week. The Giants are five and one. The Vikings are five and one. The Cowboys what a league have... this is, dude! You got the Eagles running away with it, and then behind them is the New York Giants and the Minnesota Vikings at five and one. What kind of season is this? I don't. It's every year. Last year was a very weird year. 
this is even is weirder. Even weirder. This is last year has nothing on twenty twenty two, dude. This season is it's strange. There was no good teams last year. This year we don't even know yet. It's too early. But all the teams that we thought were really good last year have been dreadful this year. The 49ers are three and three. The Packers are three and three. The Rams. Are, I don't even know what their record is. Probably the Rams are decent. terrible. The, the yeah, Rams they're are terrible. Th- they're three and three, and they look terrible. Yeah, it's they're the, bad. It's, you you very, got the big bad. dogs this season. Last year there were no like there was no like major contender. This year there is. You've got the Eagles, who are obviously the Super Bowl favorites. I don't know if they actually are, but if it's not them, it's the Buffalo Bills, who also look fantastic. And behind them, I'd say it's the Kansas City Chiefs, who even them have looked mediocre in a lot of games this season. But I'd yeah. say those are the the three teams at the top of the league. Everything else is just like so average. Even the the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, like even as yeah. they're getting their receivers healthy, healthy, they lose to the Pittsburgh Steelers and Mitch Trubisky on Sunday. Like that's the only thing that the Packers have going for them, especially in such a weak conference. That the, the the rest of the league, they are not making the Packers pay for their mistakes so far. Yeah, I guess that's the one thing to be at least. Uh, you know, a silver lining for us right now is that these other teams that were in the playoffs last year, uh, like we mentioned, all those teams in the NFC, they just haven't been that good, and that n- includes us, of course. So that's the one silver lining. The fact that it is still very early, and we're only you know a, a game here or a game there away from kind of getting back on track. I, again, we have to start this week, and this is the chance, the opportunity, whatever we keep saying it, but. There's still plenty of time. I mean, if we go and win in Washington this week, then we go play Buffalo. If we can get a big win there, that can propel us to something great, potentially. But we have to come out and beat this football team first because we haven't beat any football teams in the past two weeks. And (laughs) we haven't even played a great one yet. So um, this is a chance that we can at least try to get back on track. And that's, that's the hope. But right now, the way we just played, Griff, there's so many concerns. And if you want to start with the offense, look no further than that pass protection that we saw, which was just abysmal throughout the entire game. It left Aaron Rodgers with little to no time to complete passes to guys that were not open regardless. Just a lot of bad, bad football going on out there against the Jets at Lambeau this past Sunday. Just terrible football. Just how much of this do you think comes down to the London hangover? Because that's not something I really thought uh, about until earlier today. But yeah, probably yeah. not. Probably yeah, probably it, just because we're not... I just, I have to say, where do you want to start? Do you want to start with the protection? I mean, I mean you got to start with the, you got to start with the offense. And the protection, I'd say, is the biggest culprit in why the Packers lost this game and why they look yeah. so terrible. They just could not guard anybody up there. And it was a lot of the times, Rodgers talked about this a little bit in his post game. But they were not sending very many pressures, let alone anything too exotic. It was their really talented four against our five for the majority of the game, and we just could not block them. It was so bizarre. And I get, we talked about it, Griff. We seem to be very good at predicting the key components of why we're losing these games because we point out, this week we pointed out that Jets defensive front is really good. They've got good talent there. These are supposed to be the strengths of our team. When you talk about the defensive line and the offensive line, we've built these parts of our franchise to be the cornerstones of why we win football games with this group and it's just not there right now and and there's a lot of there's a lot of things wrong with the offensive line I think it starts with the fact that Royce Newman is in the game and that sounds harsh but it's the reality (laughs) the fact that he's in the game is the problem (laughs) he is just so bad like he's missing assignments and LaFleur rarely does this but he called a player by name out for missing plays and it was Royce Newman he did that on Monday I don't think Matt has ever done that we talked about last week about how Matt is such a player's coach and he will never throw anyone under the bus he did that against he did that to Royce Newman which shows you just how terrible his performance was it was bad. It was bad the week before against New York. It's been bad all season and he It's been bad his whole enough. career some would say. I would say. The funny thing we is that say. I I feel like we we've hated on Royce Newman for 2 years in a row now and for probably the first 3 games of this season, I felt kind of bad about it because he wasn't looking like an all-star out there, but he had played serviceable football where you really didn't notice him if you weren't watching him. But then these last 2 weeks, especially against the Jets, it was like God, get him off the field, Matt. What are we doing here? Yeah, he was ridiculously bad. And then they did pull him off the field at one point, but then 
Jake Hansen got hurt, so they sent him back in, which is, a, I'm sure he was really feeling a great morale boost after being benched and having to go back in. <laughs> Why not go with Zach Tom at that point? It just makes no sense. Like, that's the decision. Like, you forget that these players are human beings. Like, do you really think Royce is going to be playing his best after he just got benched and now he's getting back in because of an injury? <laughs> that's a great that's, morale boost. Yeah, that's another All right, thing. Royce, like, good job, Matt. buddy. You're back in. Yeah, you earned this one, three buddy. Snaps. <laughs> he earned it. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> man, come on. Like that's a just a that seems like a rookie error by Matt LaFleur. How are That we was God that talking Chris? to Matt LaFleur. That was God telling him Hansen's not your best option at right guard either. Yeah, like the, try again. Like one of the <laughs> it's just like, come on, man. Like that that's silly by Matt LaFleur. Like he's supposed to be our head coach. He can't be making just ill advised decisions like that that are putting our football team in a bad position and a position that is going to end up losing us football games. And that's just a little thing, but it certainly has an impact because how you know what's going through Royce's mind at that moment. He's just like questioning everything about his current status. Like he, now he's thinking, wow, I, I really have to play well or I'm going to lose my job again. It's just like, and it just changes the whole offensive line because if not, if one of those 11 guys aren't doing their job at a high level, then everybody's in trouble, and that's what's been going on. Matt LaFleur mentioned that. Rodgers has talked about that. And, man, with the protection that we had, Elton Jenkins did not look good once again. And you go through the list. Josh Myers has looked serviceable at best this year. He did not play great. None of these guys have played well except David Bakhtiari, who's kind of settling in now, which is so great to see, which is good that we have him on the left side kind of bookending things for Aaron. But other than that, just a lot of bad football being played and when you talk about the Jets they just manhandled us with four man pressures versus our five guys it's just unreal can't believe it I think they sent more than four guys on three or four plays that's it the Packers could not handle any of the stunts and twists anytime a stunt being when the defensive end crashes around to the interior and whoever's on the interior goes around the outside over the edge and the Packers whenever they did that they just they were tur- literally turned around like facing Aaron like they just got oh so lost gosh. John Runyon and that's not uncommon for the Jets that's what they do that's instead of sending these pressures they send the stunts and said it's just an easier way like, for them they want to do a lot more they want to do a lot more nickel and they want to have more you know the small personnel on the field so instead of having these big man boxes, if they're going to leave the middle field open like that, I mean, it's just like, I don't, you know what I mean? Like, they should have prepared for that, and they should be able to execute it. Yeah, they could not. I don't know if they prepared for it, but it didn't look like it. And if they did, they definitely didn't execute. John Runyon comes into this game. Everyone's talking about how he hasn't allowed a pressure, which I'm not taking away from him. Great job, John. He was the only guard in the league who hadn't allowed a pressure. Sunday, he he allows four pressures alone in that game on Sunday. And all of those, I guarantee, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but I guarantee most, if not all, of those pressures came on stunts because every single time I remember the Jets running them, someone was facing Aaron Rodgers with the Jets defender running right at him. Oh, my gosh. The the only bright spot on the O-line would be David Bakhtiari, who you mentioned played really well. He shut down Carl Lawson, who's a really good edge rusher. Uh, really but good everyone player. else, everyone else, man. God, Elton Jenkins at right tackle for the fourth game in a row or fifth game in a row. We're coming out saying, hey, maybe he's better at guard. Yeah, it's maybe time. he is, yeah. Matt. Maybe it's time to put him back at the spot where he went to a Pro Bowl. Yeah, Griff, you're right. And I had said, like, let's give him an opportunity to kind of settle back in in terms of his ACL injury and but he's just he's not back yet. I think it'd be He an doesn't look time. like a tackle. You love the he versatility. He doesn't look like he used to. You love that when you need him to put him at tackle, he can do it and he can play well enough for a half. But he is not a tackle. He was never a tackle. This is a new thing for him in terms of NFL. He he came into the league as a center. And then we put him at guard. The one position he hasn't played in the regular season is right guard, but he never played right tackle, uh, at least consistently, at any other level of his uh, college career. And now he's doing it in the NFL, and the fact that he's done this well, and he's played better in the past, I think, than he's playing right now, but coming off this injury, putting him right back at right tackle probably wasn't the right move in hindsight. I think it's now time to put him back next to David and feel really good about that left side just knowing that that's something you can lean on, I think, in both the run and the pass game, to be confident that those two guys next to each other will be really, really solid, then I think you move Runyon to the right guard spot 
And then probably Yash, I would say, is the guy that you would bring up. Let him play right tackle because he's done that, and he is our swing tackle at this point. I think that's probably the correct move for this offensive line to get into a position where we feel strongly about the way that we can protect Aaron Rodgers because he is not, you know, able to move the same way that some of these younger guys in the league can today, and we need to make sure <laughs> that he not. stays protected. We need to, we just need to protect him at a high level because if we can't do that, we're not going to win. And we saw what happens on, you know, when the Jets can pressure us with four and Rodgers is getting hit eight times, sacked four times, it just can't happen. And he's not able to do his job. And it's just, and that's the reality. And, and Rodgers is going to get blamed for that. But there's just too many issues going on around him for me to have any consideration of, of truly blaming Aaron for, for these issues that we have going on. Yeah, we're going to get into that. But look, if you move Elton to guard, you're getting better at guard, at one whatever guard spot, you're getting better at guard, and you're probably getting better at right tackle as well if you put Yash there. And if you're not getting better, I have I have a hard time believing you're going to get any worse than what Elton has given you there for five games. So I think it, I, I think it should be that easy. But yeah, so Aaron's he sacked four times. Unbelievable. 15 quarterback pressures. Fifth, do you do you understand how many pressures that is? Fifteen pressures, three quarterback hits per PFF. I mean, I get it, man. I get. Aaron Rodgers has not looked like an MVP. He has missed some easy, easy throws. The deep balls in the past two games, especially, have been way off the mark, and it looks like I don't even know who he's throwing to. But you cannot succeed. As a quarterback, when you're getting 15 pressures, you're getting sacked four times. And I, I believe that sacks are on the quarterback for the most part, but a lot of those sacks, if not all of those sacks, I would blame on the offensive line and not Aaron Rodgers. And he's hit three times, and hard hits too. Hard hits. I, I, and he's already has an injured thumb, and he's throwing to Alan Lazard as his number one receiver. I have a really hard time coming out of any game this season saying that Aaron Rodgers is the biggest problem with this offense. And I get it. I get I I will listen to the arguments from people who want to have a polite conversation about whether we should have moved off of Aaron Rodgers this offseason, whether it has to do with our Super Bowl window closing and Brian Gutekunst should have been aware of that, whatever. I'm willing to listen to those conversations, but anyone, and there are people like this out here, Bron, you and I both know this, anyone who thinks that Aaron Rodgers is a negative aspect of the Packers' offense and putting in Jordan Love would actually improve this offense, I need you to wake up. Because there is no chance that Jordan Love steps into this offense. If he were to step into that game on Sunday against the New York Jets, there is no reality where he would do any better than what Aaron Rodgers put out there. Because he's got guys in his face within two seconds. And when he has more than two seconds, guess what? No one's open. No, Griff, I don't even listen to those arguments about Jordan Love coming in the game. I mean... That's just silly. Aaron Rodgers is... It's just a waste of time even thinking about that because Aaron Rodgers is our quarterback and, and he is playing... He's he's playing at an elite level, but is he playing at the MVP level? It's going to be hard to do that when, A, you don't have the receivers that can really get open consistently, and B, the offensive line isn't protecting you. So there's a problem here. And it's been a common theme throughout this entire season. When Rodgers is not making magic... There, we had moments of success in this game, Griff. But the and only it was Rodgers success, making magic. It was Rodgers making magic to guys like Tunyon who were getting open off schedule. And it's just like, what do you want him to do? He, the the only throw reason, down the sideline to Lazard in the first half, the 35-yarder. Oh, my God. That throw he wasn't open was for the record incredible. at all. But no, Lazard was not, not even close to being open. He was blanketed by two guys. Rodgers <laughs> had to hand it off to him to manufacture a big play. And then the one touchdown pass was just literally thrown by Rodgers open for the touchdown. Lazard yeah. was basically covered, but Rodgers gives him the back shoulder, and Lazard just, like, falls right into it. And it's just, like, a perfect throw. No other quarterback's making that throw or that adjustment. Like, it's just, ugh. There's, I feel so bad at times for, for what he has to go through because he is not— and he's getting blamed heavily. I think he is— absolutely the least of our issues right now by far there are a lot of things that we need to handle um and it starts with the game plan and it it ends 
with the fact that we really don't have the talent to execute the game plan right now. I don't want to absolve Aaron of any blame because I think he does need to be blamed for some of the easy stuff, some of the easy throws that he's just not making, that he's made for two years now. And people want to bring up 2018 Aaron Rodgers being back in the offense, and I think that is a tad ridiculous because he's, like I said last week, he's not playing hero ball, he's not playing outside of structure when he doesn't have to, he's not turning down open guys. I, he's not I throwing the ball. Away either. He's not throwing no, the ball away either. No, he's not throwing the ball away. That was the biggest thing that everyone complained about, myself included, him throwing the ball away. But he's not doing that either. But the biggest thing with 2018 Aaron Rodgers, if you want to call 2018 Aaron Rodgers, if you want to say that he's back, the biggest thing I think would be missing easy throws because Aaron has done that one too many times, a few too many times for my liking. The the first drive of the game, a near pick six to Sauce Gardner that barely touched the ground, thankfully. Otherwise, we lo- would have lost by three scores rather than or four scores rather than three. But that throw. God, that's a throw Aaron makes in his sleep. That's a no-looker that Aaron makes last year. And he misses them every now and then because we know how he is. We know he gets a little lazy with the footwork, but most of the time it's not a problem. But I think a few too many times this season, it has been a problem. And I think he's he said he's got to raise his game a tick. I would say a little bit more than a tick, Aaron. I need you to make these easy throws because when you're not making these easy throws, you're relying on making the big-time throws like the 35-yarder to Lazard, like the back shoulder to Lazard for the touchdown you when you're not make taking the easy stuff that the defense is giving you you're forcing yourself to have to make these impossible throws on a down by down basis and that's unsustainable and I think if he were to just hit every easy throw that's there the Packers I don't think they'd be great but I think they'd be in a lot better situation than they are right now yeah I mean of course we've seen the missed throws this year and that's that's a problem and he has the thumb issue that was Clearly a, a problem for him. He had been dealing with that throughout that whole game. And, look, I'm, I'm not saying Rodgers is, is not to blame because I think everybody is to blame. There's just too many things going wrong for us not to, you know, everybody's got a hand in that, and Rodgers included, of course. Uh, but I think it's a, it falls a lot less on him than it does some of the other things we've talked about. And with him specifically, I think, like you said, you made a great point about the easy throws. Those things are the uh, the parts that we need to really make sure that can get done because we can't operate on offense if we can only make those hard throws or those difficult throws happen. We need to get that easy stuff locked down in order to unlock some of those those more difficult plays and, and really get, get it together on offense. But the problem is, too, there was a lot of drops on Sunday, you know, a lot of silly things going on where Rodgers really can't feel comfortable making any throw, let alone the easy stuff or the difficult stuff. So it's just a lot. I I do think that he has to play better, of course, but he is dealing with a lot around him that he can't control. Uh, that's 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 going to make things harder on him, and, and I just hope that we can figure it out because I think he's throwing the ball really well. Like He continues to impress me with some of the th- – like, there's not a game that goes by where he doesn't impress you with at least a handful of throws that that make you excited about what he's doing as a quarterback. But there's still a lot left on the table as well, and I think some of those things that are outside of his control have to start turning in our favor in order for him to really unlock that next level of play that can get him to that MVP status that he's been at for the last three years. And I think that, I don't know if you agree with this, but I think he's got to be at that level if the Packers are going to be good this year because this, this offense team, is yeah. not it's not talented enough for him to be anything other than an MVP. He's got to raise his play if the Packers are going to be good. That's the reality and that's the sad reality because It he is has the sad reality because Patrick Mahomes last season can be a top 10 quarterback rather than a top 1 quarterback and the Chiefs are fine. But we don't have that luxury because we have Alan Lazard, Romeo Dobbs on the field, Jawan Winfrey's getting snaps. Like this team is just not good enough for Aaron yeah. Yeah, no, anything other this week, which was nice. Jawan, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's six drops by the Packers receivers. It was raining, but Ugh, I, that was not good. I'm Jones had a drop. Dylan had a few. I don't know what was going on with that offense, man. There's too many, too many wrongdoings on on every part of that. Whether we were running the ball and everybody was screaming, "Run the ball, run the ball!" and then we go out with this game plan of running the football at a high rate, and we're just not moving the line of scrimmage whatsoever, and we can't get anything going. Dylan looks lifeless 
uh, throughout that whole game just looked completely unexplosive. Aaron Jones had chances and bursts of opportunities to move the ball. Some of them got called back. Sometimes he was getting stonewalled as well. It's just the running game could not get going. We didn't get Aaron Jones the ball enough in the passing game, but he did have a drop or two here and there. There's just a lot of complications with this group right now, and I hope these things are fixable. The one good thing is we didn't turn the ball over uh, on, you know, in terms of Aaron Rodgers throwing a pick because, you know, that's not something we expect to happen, which is good. We need to continue that. But we had a silly fumble where Dylan just did not hang on to the handoff and like, that things was like that. Such a silly fumble, man. This just, was probably oh, God. that was probably Dylan's worst game as a Packer, which is remarkable. I don't know how that happened, but we can't. That's why I think maybe it's time for Aaron Jones to get the majority of these touches and and just keep oh, AJ you think? Dylan. Yeah. <laughs> God, dude. I think we need to keep AJ Dylan as that kind of change of pace power back for when we need that short yardage. And we know he can do some other things, but on that that field on Sunday against the Jets, I don't know if it was the footing that he was getting because, or the footing he wasn't getting, I guess, because of the rain or whatever. He just did not play well at all. AJ Dillon is a great closer. When you're up by two scores in the fourth quarter, he is great to close out the game. Between the tackles, he's fantastic. He will truck your defensive lineman. He will he will get tackled minus one yards behind the line of scrimmage and get a four yard gain out of it just by power. But I don't understand why they're making more of an effort to get the ball in his hands than Aaron in Jones space. is. In space. It makes too. no sense. Aaron Jones touches the ball three times in the first half. Three times. Mm. He's only on the field for fifty six percent of snaps. And I know he got injured in the second half, but even before that, he wasn't on the field a whole lot. Griff, this is when the score was 3-3. Three to three. He had three touches at half. Are you kidding me? How do they feel good about that? And then what is Matt LaFleur going to say? Like He comes out and says we need to get him the ball more every week, and then he never does it. I don't understand. How are they going to literally... It makes no sense. It's not like they have the excuse that they can just say to the media to make it seem like they're getting him the ball, but they had no choice because it's garbage time and they got to come back and score points. He had three touches in the first half, and that was when the score was literally 0-0 zero to zero for the majority of the game. It doesn't make any sense. It's inexcusable. That's another reason why Matt LaFleur is really disappointing me and a lot of other Packers fans out there right now. He's just not doing a good enough job of utilizing his players at the best level and do, helping them do what they do best, putting them in the best positions to succeed. There's a disconnect between him and the quarterback right now that I don't understand. But, I mean, there's just things that – just too many issues – and a lot of them stem with Matt. We talked about what went on with the offensive line, and those are things. He's too late. It's too late. He, we're six weeks in, and he's just now realizing Royce is the problem. It's too late. We've been saying this, Griff, for over a year, and they continue to start him. And we said it during training camp, and we said it in the preseason, and they continued to start him, and that's on him. Because now it's come to hurt us in many games, and they're just now finally deciding that enough's enough. It's too late. They're too late to make these decisions. They have to start being proactive instead of reactive. And why is Hanson the next guy up at right guard? That's another thing that I'm not even going to get into. I want to go back to Aaron Jones. But Aaron Jones, can we create a game plan around him? Can we come into a game with the offensive philosophy of the week being, let's find creative ways to get him the ball. If you don't want to be creative, fine. Just hand him the ball. Just give him the ball. Give him the ball on a swing pass. Do something. But I'd rather, and I think Matt and Aaron are both smart enough to come into a game with creative ways of getting their best player the ball. Because your offense, this is the least talented offense that Matt LaFleur has ever had, I would say. So when you come into a season like that, if you're Matt LaFleur, when you know you're coming into this season with Alan Lazard as the best player you have as a pass catcher, then how do you not have the self-awareness to know that you have to feature your best player, Aaron Jones, outside of Aaron Rodgers. He is the best player by far that we have on offense. I don't understand. It, like, Can you imagine in 2020 if the Packers had Devontae Adams on the field for 56% of snaps or gave him the ball three times a game? It would wow. be ridiculous. That's, That's what they're doing with it. Aaron Jones. That's a really great way to put it, Griff. I think you hit the nail on the head there. Man, it's just, it really is surprising because the, the worst part is that he continues to lie 
and say that he's going to really give them the ball this week and he's going to uh, I mean, like, just what are you going to do here? Just say you don't want to run the ball with Aaron Jones or just say you don't want to give him the ball. It doesn't make any sense. And, Griff, we, you, you and I both know better than anybody that we're not those type of people that just say, run the ball, run it. It's like we're not doing that. <laughs> We want Aaron Rodgers to have the ball in his hands, but the problem is when he throws it to another guy's hands, it's either dropped or it's just not good enough because they're not open. Unless Rodgers literally throws handoffs, these guys aren't making plays. <laughs> Everything Unless looks he's dropping so difficult. Thirty-five yard handoffs. <laughs> there's there's just it's no just, opportunity to make plays. It's, I don't. How can they feel good about this receiving group? But the good news is, folks, they're bringing in a guy named Ty Freifogel. Uh, who was an undrafted kid. He got hurt, but he's going to come in to the practice squad, it looks like here, and save the day. So. <laughs> Thank God. See, now what everyone's always Adam? whining about how the Rams bring in OBJ and yada, yada, yada. The Packers finally make a move. Thank you, Brian. We have to give credit where credit is due. <laughs> Thank Brian. you, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> it's so sorry, honestly. And you know what the worst thing is? Griff, let's talk about this if you want to switch gears here for a moment. Robbie Anderson had this big meltdown in Carolina with the coaches or whatever, and it got me thinking, right? Okay, now this is a guy that they've had interest in in the past. I'm thinking this is a guy we go get. I don't know what it's going to cost. Maybe it's in a release, but I'm thinking this is a guy we sign, and there's a few reasons for that. I think we need to make an uncomfortable move, which any move would be an uncomfortable move, frankly, but this move in particular... If we were to go get Robbie Anderson, and this is obviously he's now been traded to the Arizona Cardinals, so this is all for naught, but he had this big meltdown with his coaches, and he's a talented player, I feel like. He's a deep threat. There was a lot of things that made sense. The only thing that we would have had to pay for was his prorated salary of $690,000. His the end, what what ended up being the trade compensation was only a sixth round pick in 2024 and a seventh round pick in 2025, so those are Brian's most prized possessions, aka. <laughs> anyway, um, I bet Freifogel so, is going to make close to that number. <laughs> probably exactly. <laughs> that's what and that's what makes no sense. Anyway, so everybody, so now I'm thinking we hash. This is a move we should make. But, you know, anybody who would disagree would say, oh, we don't want a locker room cancer like that coming into this locker room and destroying it. First of all, I feel like we should make the uncomfortable move of realizing that we are supposed to be an organization that prides itself on culture. Why are we not one of these teams like the Patriots or the Buccaneers or the Rams, even other teams, you talk about the Steelers, teams that have these cultures and bring guys in and they are the teams that kind of make these guys that have attitude issues fall in line. Why are we not one of those teams that does that? Why can't we be one of those teams that makes a move to get a guy with a ton of talent, but he has some attitude issues or he has some off-the-field issues? We should be looking for guys like that because we should be able to make them fall in line. And it's not like we can lose any more games because we have now lost to two terrible football teams. We can't lose any greater than we've been losing. What is the harm going to be? We need receiving weapons. We need talent. We're now going to Freifogel for our hopes. This is us. <laughs> I hope this guy doesn't really become a star here after what I'm saying. But this is, uh, it's just, it makes no sense. Why don't we go and make that move? Why are we not the team that brings in these guys to come fall in line and be a part of something special? And it doesn't make any sense to me. That should be the way Green Bay operates because we have the leaders to set the tone, like Aaron Rodgers, like Randall Cobb. It's time that we we operate like that. Yeah, Robbie Anderson's not a guy that I'm going to get too passionate over the Packers making a move or not making. It's a move. not just him, Griff. He's just because an example. You know, I, that. I know what you I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying, but I don't think Robbie is that good of a player, and also I don't think he's that good of a person. But I do understand what you're saying with the fact that the Packers they never seem to go after guys who have these. Uh, who are perceived to be locker room divas or something similar. The Packers, they usually stay away from that, and I do understand what you're saying about the fact that, you know, other teams, they put up with it, and they win Super Bowls. So sometimes you've got to you gotta draw the line somewhere with your cultural, organizational philosophies. You know, you've got to get out of your comfort zone a little bit, especially when you're 3-3 three and three coming off a loss to the New York Jets. So I get what you're saying there, but I want to I wanna talk about 
what Rodgers was saying after the game. Um, I want to know your thoughts on this. So he's talking about the need to simplify the offense. Matt LaFleur was asked about it today. What does he say? I don't even know what he's talking about. Pretty funny there. It, it, all, comes, it all circles back to your, your uh, little bit of a rant to open last week's show about the true disconnect going on in the Packers locker room. This is just another example of that. Rodgers is talking about needing to simplify the offense. Didn't really get into specifics. The one thing he did mention was motion which we know going back to 2019 is something that maybe did make him a little bit uncomfortable at first, but he, you know, it won him back-to-back MVPs, and so you think now he's comfortable with it, but now he's talking about how the motion maybe complicates things that don't need to be so complicated. I don't know. What what are your thoughts about this this kind of uh, this discourse going on? So when Rodgers talks about the motion and the complication and simplifying things, he's certainly not talking about for himself because he can handle all of that. And this was never a conversation when you're talking about guys like Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams operating at a high level. But over the course of the last three years, because of the lack of talent we've had at wide receiver other than Devontae Adams, these are the conversations that go on. And now it's exponentially more clear because of what's going on without Devontae Adams on the field, Rodgers knows that these young guys cannot handle all that's being thrown at them. This is a successful offense. This is designed for a team to win a Super Bowl, this offense. It is a high-class offense with a lot of detail, and it's very difficult to understand, but it's also, you know, I would say it's extremely executable, and it can be understood at a high level with players that can execute it at that level. But the problem is, these guys that we have are not talented enough and are either too young or too inexperienced, do not have a grip on what it means to be a part of this offense. And they can't they can't operate at a high enough level for us to have success using it. These guys just aren't talented enough. Rodgers knows that, but he has hope that these guys can develop, but he knows that we need more. He won't come out and say that because that's obviously a disrespectful statement to the guys in the he locker room. He has hinted at that more than ever. I think this he has many times he has and that's you know he can't say it he will never come out and say we need more because that's just disrespectful to his guys and he will never say that but he has hinted at it he's had he's hinted that you know it's not up to him but if they feel like they need more then you go and make some moves and he was very blunt about that uh, because he he knows it's just it's a reality it truly is they don't have enough and if they sit and do nothing once again, Griff, they will be comfortable wasting one of Rodgers' final seasons in Green Bay. He's signed this massive contract. How disappointing for him. This is why I don't blame him. Because how can you blame him when things like this go on on a consistent basis during his tenure? It's a sad reality. I, I don't know what to say, really. But there's time to make moves. They just have to make the right moves. That's the thing. They have to go out and do it. I wish Rodgers was a little more aggressive with that. I wish he would go to Brian and say we need this because he should be relied on to understand that these guys can't do it at a high level. He, he One thing that was mentioned, he says this team can be a successful team and it can be a great team if there's some development from these guys that we haven't seen yet. But when asked about if they need more to be a, a truly playoff Super Bowl caliber team playing in January and February... He said, he, you know, he kind of hinted that he thinks that more needs to be done. Probably a move or two needs to be made. And I think that's the case. Now, I don't know what those moves are specifically. We've talked a lot about Odell Beckham Jr. He's not ready. So I don't know what the move is. But we have to make something happen soon here because we cannot afford to lose many more games, especially in these next few. We just can't. So it's time to figure out what the move is and make it now and do it and get ready to win and try to put our best guys out there in order to have a chance to really get back into the playoffs. And then we go from there with a new look and a new outlook on this team. I think the youth at the receiver position is more of a factor than the talent level. And I think I've addressed the talent level, you know, this season. But I think it's more of a youth problem because we know Christian Watson is talented. We know Romeo Dobbs is talented. Romeo Dobbs is still getting open pretty often. But I think the youth is the biggest thing because Aaron Rodgers is such, he's so trust-reliant. 
And when you're a young player, you're a fourth round pick, or you're Christian Watson, a second round pick coming out of an F- coming out of an FCS school, and you're you're now in the NFL, starting playing against starting cornerbacks, playing with Aaron Rodgers, you have he needs his guys to be in the exact spot that he needs them to be. Do you know what I'm saying? He he needs you to cut your route. Here, not not two yards up here. He doesn't need you to round it up or he's going to look away. He needs you to be where he knows where he can expect you to be because he throws with such anticipation. He needs his guys to be on the same page as him. And Romeo Dobbs is getting open. A, a play coming to mind right now. The fourth and two slot fade to Romeo. He was on motion. He motions across. They snap the ball and he runs up the sideline on a fade route. He is open by a step. Rodgers puts it maybe three steps in front of him where he's reaching his arms out and it's just in front of him. Now that has happened a lot this season and it's happened a lot on deep throws to Romeo specifically that make you think, wow, Rodgers is really off the mark. That's exactly what I said maybe 20 minutes ago. Rodgers is off the mark on these deep balls. But you have to think maybe maybe it has to do with the youth at that position. Maybe it has to do with Romeo just not having enough reps under his belt to know how to run these routes, to know where to be when Aaron's hit the top of his drop. You know, on that play specifically, Griff, I can tell you for a fact that Romeo was definitely cut off his route at the beginning. He was running that route a lot more roundabout than he probably was supposed to. And Rod and look, he was getting pressed a little bit, I think. He was or whenever he got I don't remember exactly what it was like in terms of the coverage, but whenever the corner got to him, he was definitely knocked off the spot. I can tell you for that. His route was disrupted. And that had something to do with the fact that the throw ended up being in front of in front of him by a couple couple steps. But the problem is there is is what do you do? I mean Rogers has no choice because Romeo is getting separation, but he got knocked off the spot, and Rodgers has to get that thing out. It's fourth and two. You can't take a sack. You know what I mean? He sees him. He's going to have to throw it. It's Romeo's job to get to that spot. And Rodgers has missed throws. We know that. But to me, that particular play, people point to that as a missed throw from Aaron. I, As soon as I saw that play live, it, it was clear that Romeo was knocked off his route. It just it was clear. Yeah, and that's happened a lot this season. And at some point, you got to think, you know, is Aaron, has he taken a step back? Is he really just not an accurate quarterback? That's what he's always been. That's what the the biggest strength of his play as a quarterback has always been his accuracy. Are we going to believe that he is now not as accurate and he's now just going to miss throws like that often? I mean, maybe, but what do you think is more likely, that or Romeo Dobbs is just too young of a player and is too inexperienced with Aaron Rodgers to know where to be on these types of plays? Because I feel like it's a higher chance that that's the issue, the latter. I I feel like that is more than likely the issue there. So this all comes back to Rodgers talking about the the complexities of the offense and how they need to simplify it. Because I think you made a great point when you were talking about how it's it's not too complex for Aaron. He's smart enough. He understands the playbook. He knows what needs to be happening pre-snap. He knows where to go with the ball. But I think he is talking about the youth of the receiver group. This was like the most polite way he could call them out without directly calling them out. But I think he was saying that they are just not talented enough and they're too young for a playbook that's this complex, which you can have arguments about. We won't because we don't really know what's going on in the locker room. And it's a whole other thing with Aaron in the floor. You know, I think that's kind of been blown up a little bit out of proportion about Matt saying at the press conference today, I don't even know what that means. Because you have to think that they've had these private discussions in the locker room. They certainly had that conversation on the before. They had that conversation that morning. I I, I don't. (laughs) Yeah, they had that conversation last year, probably. They've had that. Yes, they've been. Rogers said, you know, this is not new. And we've had these conversations ourselves, Griff. This is not new. They know that when Aaron Aaron thinks when they are not connecting well on offense, it's because they don't have the personnel, and he's not going to say that, but if they, if they believe in this group of personnel that they have, which they continuously do each and every year, then it can't be this, this, it can't be this way. They need to have it right. so that these guys can have a grasp of the offense because – these guys are just basically coming out of college. Our main contributors are just coming out of college or Amari Rogers, you know, a year removed from college. Like the guys that were in the game against the Jets, these guys can't handle what we're doing. They're not ready for this kind of level of offense. This is a very, very high-level offense, but they don't have the guys that have the experience 
the nuance to be able to operate it at a high level. And it takes high level operation. Is It's the only way to execute this offense properly. And I think that's why they like a guy like Alan Lazard so much. Because say what you will about his talent level, he is a master of this offense. He knows yes. his role. He's always where he needs to be. That's why Aaron throws to him constantly. But Aaron went out of his way to stress that this, this scheme is good enough to win football games. He went out of his way to say that. This scheme is good enough, and when you have the right players, it can su- succeed. But I think he was saying, without directly saying, that our players just aren't good enough to execute this offense. So that's what he's getting at with the need to simplify it, which, I don't know. I don't even know if I buy into that, because the, the simple offense, I feel like, is just more easy to defend and could potentially show our weaknesses more so than the Matt LaFleur complex quote, complex offense already does. Let me add to that, Griff. Actually, you know, what a great point that I think you're probably, you know, along the lines of making. It's It really comes down to then, in this simple offense, I think it might be more reliant on the talent at that point because when you talk about the way that this offense operates, it's trying to get guys open regardless of the talent level. And it's right. just our talent level is a lot worse than than probably what Matt would hope for and what Aaron would hope for. And I'm not probably I'm not, 30 not. teams in the league. <laughs> <laughs> probably the Bears is the only one, right? That's but, exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. Wait, good way to get the Bears a little hate in here, too, which is fun always. At least we can still do that. But, um, yeah, it's just like you look at that and it's like, well, then are we more reliant on these guys getting open or uh, that? That's what what do you what do you think it means to be simplifying our offense? Because that probably means less motion. And some of those things give you tells on what the defense is running, whether it's man versus zone. It gives you a lot of different things that I mean, Matt LaFleur has talked a lot about what the because this has been a discourse for a while about running motion and, and different things that Aaron at first wasn't, you know, totally thrilled with but um they run it a lot and he thinks it's necessary they don't do it just to do it he said today and i i I believe in that i don't i don't ever question the offense i never question matt lafleur's offense and and what he's brought to the table the things i question with him stem from his operation and some of the decisions he makes, and what the, probably the disconnect with Aaron. I don't know if it's because Aaron is afraid to say that he doesn't feel like that, that group is talented enough. Has he said that behind closed doors? I don't know. But that's the reality, and um, I just I wish there would be a little more aggression to, uh, to make that something that they can correct with moves that need to be made. And I wish Aaron had a more of a say in that or, or more, I don't know. I wish he was more vocal about that, I guess. This supporting cast is just so, just so painfully average. Like we talk about the bears, haha, the bears suck, but how much better are we really supporting cast wise than the Chicago bears? Not much, really not no. much. And I hate that we have to spend so much time hating on these guys like Romeo Dobbs because and I'm not I'm not hating on Romeo Dobbs. I think he's going to be a great player. It's more so me hating on the front office for coming into a season having to have Romeo Dobbs be a master of the playbook 6 games into his career. You know, like do we really have to put ourselves in this position where Cobb goes down. Sammy Watkins is on IR. So guess what? We've got Jawan Winfrey on the final fourth and twelve play to <laughs> <laughs> to close the game. We've got oh, Jawan Winfrey on heart. the field. That just broke God. my heart. Like all of this stuff is just self-inflicted. And it, did it really have to be this way? They. I just can't believe they went into a season with the idea that Romeo Dobbs was going to be our our savior or replacement for Devontae they Adams. They fooled me. They fooled me. Because I... No, I, we never I, thought... We never... We never. We knew, always knew it was going to be a challenge. And we knew it was going to be a... We a, knew it was going to be a challenge, but I, I had my green and yellow glasses on where I'm seeing Romeo Dobbs in training camp and he's I'm going to buy his jersey and he's going to be an all-pro rookie of the year, all of this. And it's like, you know, <laughs> he could still be that, I guess. But it, it sucks that we have to have these such high expectations of a fourth round pick it'd be so much better if we had guys who could start and then Romeo could come in late in the game when we're already up two scores and make plays and get us all excited for what he can be but no it's not like that now it's like oh Romeo's not making enough plays we just lost to the Jets yeah we did just lose to the Jets and it's not good enough so we we need to get better because we're trying to win a Super Bowl we're not trying to 
you know, run a football camp here and get these young guys to, to learn how to play football. <laughs> it's not so, training camp anymore. Yeah, it's, it's really it's really not training camp anymore. And this is we what Rodgers was talking about. How many times did Aaron talk about during training camp? Like, it, it's a short window. It's a sh- it's got to be a short learning curve for these guys. They've got to be able. They've got to figure it out quickly because the regular season is coming up, and we've got to win games. And we're in week six, and I feel like he's still not fully confident in most of these receivers. I had faith, Griff. We talked about this in during training camp. I had faith that this offense, predicated on scheme, getting guys open as opposed to the talent level, making guys you know open up for Aaron Rodgers to throw to. I had faith in this offense to be able to continue passing at a high level, but we just the talent isn't there enough, and it's not you know I don't know what the real issue. I guess I mean the issue is the talent, but I it's the offense isn't good enough that it's just getting guys open all over the field regardless of how talented they are. And it's just not enough. We don't have enough. I had faith that that could be a possibility, but now seeing it through six games, we our, our fears have become realized, and it's just not good enough. So now they must react. Uh, instead of being proactive, which they should have done, they're now going to have to react once again. But hopefully they at least react. You know, I, I would like to see moves be made. We can't guarantee it with the way that this front office has operated throughout the course of the last several, throughout their history. <laughs> so, just at all time. Yeah, I, I, I really am uh, unsure. Everybody, every year, we make these same hopes that they're gonna make a, a move to to acquire talent because they never have enough, and they never do it. At least not to to the level we hope. They've they've gotten guys from free agency. They've made trades here and there that you know but it's never been enough we never felt like oh this is the Super Bowl move that we needed Odell wait you Beckham, don't think that the trade for Isaac Yidem last year was enough looking back that at a- that that was probably the best move we've ever made <laughs> that was the biggest trade we've made since when again the Reggie Gilbert said, trade for a six round pick in 2018 thought, I never thought we'd say Isaac Yidem again but here we are again that's twice this, like this the season third I've time. mentioned him is it the twice yeah I, I never thought we'd hear that again yet you keep bringing his name up you know this is going back to what you were talking about before this is why I feel like simplifying the offense maybe isn't the best thing to do because we we don't have the talent to win one on one we know that and that's nope. what Matt LaFleur's strength is supposed to not be not even Allen not even Allen and he's our no. number one Ra- Randall not- Cobb is the only consistent one on one winner I-, I can think of in Randall his Cobb will beat a slot cornerback pretty often but now he's sidelined. So Ugh. we're not good enough to win these one-on-one matchups. We're not good enough to run the Mike McCarthy offense. So we, your hunch is that you have to lean on the Matt LaFleur offense. You have to go back to the scheming and scheme guys open. But that's not, it hasn't been happening. All year it hasn't been happening. Why is that? I don't know. I'm not a coach. I'm not going to break down the X's and O's of what, what teams are doing to counter our scheme. I don't know what it is. But guys aren't open. And this is what Matt LaFleur is supposed to be good at. This is what he brings to the table. He brings the offensive coaching background that is supposed to revolutionize the league. And it did for three years. But all of a sudden this year, guys just aren't open. And why is that? I don't know. But we've either got to bring in talent or Matt has got to change some things up. Okay, Griff, let's just move on to this defense, who I thought played very well in the first half, even stretches in the third. Uh, and even if you go all the way into the fourth at the end of the game there, on the goal line, they had very strong hold plays. Uh, that Matt LaFleur seemed to be very excited about coming out of a 27-10 to 10 loss. So, Griff, tell me what you think, in particular, impressed you most about the defense, uh, and, and what can we do to take from the positive that we had moving forward going into this game against Washington and moving forward uh, when you talk about Buffalo and some of these other teams we're going to have to play. The defense was not perfect. We all know they weren't perfect, but I think I did see a lot of things that gave me optimism moving forward. And the Jets are bad, we know that, but they're not terrible. Zach Wilson has looked okay. He's he, he's not a good quarterback, let's be honest. He's not a good quarterback, but the still, I think... Coming off of a game against the New York Giants, who were even worse talent-wise than the New York Jets, and we watched the Giants walk up and down the field on us, I I have to take the small victories in life, knowing that the Packers held the New York Jets to 27 points, 20 points defensively. But I think the biggest thing here, you have to give credit to Joe Barry, because we spent so long last week talking about where Joe Barry 
falls short. Things he does that just irritate us. We talked about the lack of man coverage. He only played man coverage about 17% of the snaps, I think. We talked about the cornerbacks playing nine yards off the line of scrimmage on every single passing down. And we talked about utilizing guys, our cornerbacks specifically, to do what they do best. And this week, I think he corrected on a lot of those mistakes because the entire game, Jair Alexander was shadowing Garrett Wilson. Oh my God, what a sight to see. I was in love. Jair in the yellow sleeves. He stands out. What is that? He's in the slot. Braun, Jair's in the slot covering Garrett Wilson, the Jets' best player. Oh my God, who came up with this idea? Who Riff, who kidnapped Joe Barry? What happened to him? It, you know, it's really remarkable how, and I'm not even trying to sound like we know everything about this game, but like, why do we continuously look I, I and the worst part is we look right and you don't want to be right we want these guys to make us wrong but we continually say these things about what they need to do and this and that and then when they when it comes time to when they finally do it we're proven right and it's like man how concerning is that because we're a couple idiots on the microphone here and and these <laughs> and and we've been saying this stuff for a while and whether you look at uh, whether we're talking about having Jair focus on one specific guy because he likes he's an island that, guy, you can go back to Week One for that when Justin Jefferson had almost 200 yards and we, all the and coverage busts. That. You can go it's, back to Week One for all of us saying that Jair needs to shadow and also you should probably play a little bit more man coverage because the zones it's not working. And then so this game they did that they pl- they ran man coverage over 40 percent of the time. Jair Alexander specifically was in man coverage I think 48 percent of the time, and he was following Garrett Wilson when targeting when Zach Wilson targeted Garrett Wilson he went 0 for 4. Jair had three pass breakups and it was beautiful watching Jair Alexander in press coverage, which is another thing they were pressing at the line of scrimmage early and often throughout the entire game. You love it. We have such good players at cornerback. Why don't you use them to the best of their ability? And that's what Joe Barry did. And watching Jair Alexander in man coverage, there are a few things like it, man. He is such a good player. And having him 10 yards off the ball, covering a tight end because he's the number one receiver, meaning he's closest to the sideline, that's just a waste of the best player on your defense. It's the same thing as Aaron Jones playing 56% of the snaps. Having Jair playing 10 yards off covering a tight end just because that's his role in cover four, like that's a waste of your Ugh. defensive personnel. Griff, there's nothing worse than seeing Jair on a running back to start a play. That's the worst. Oh feeling. my god, man! God. But you know what? You're, you're right. You're letting the offense dictate what you do at that point because then you're putting your best player in the slot, who's now matched up with Quay Walker. Yeah, it's the. I mean, that's where we're. That's where we've been at. But like you said, Joe Barry made those adjustments, and you have to give credit to him for that because you you know you can make mistakes, but if you if you correct those, now we have a foundational. I think this is now the foundation of what's going to be. Hopefully, when you talk about our overall turnaround as a franchise, as a team this season, having the defense play elite football is going to be a huge part of that. I think now that's going to be the case because this game was the foundation of what our game plan will be moving forward. And I think not even just the corners, Griff. We talk about utilizing our guys to the highest of their ability. Adrian Amos closer to the ball. We saw that, and he had a pretty really Love strong it, game, I'd say. He and, and yeah. just these guys looked a little more like I, I want to say comfortable. Really, is how they looked. Uh, just these guys that are, are doing things that they're really good at in the secondary, when you utilize them to the best of their ability, having them closer to the ball if they're better near the line of scrimmage in, in terms of what Adrian and Jair can do, letting those guys line up close because we know they're very good cover corners. I thought, really, when you look at Rasul Douglas and Jair, they are some of the stickiest corners that you've got in this league, in my opinion. And when you utilize them to do those things, Rasul very close to the line of scrimmage, getting aggressive, those are what we, that's what we got them for. Why are we paying Jair to be reactive instead of forcing his aggression and his talent to, to, to disrupt the offensive play? That's why we have these guys, and that's why we're going to be a good defense moving forward. I think, you know, people are going to be surprised, I think, when we probably go in and beat Buffalo. But I think we are going to do that. <laughs> I, I really do. Because I think our defense moving forward is going to operate at a really high level. And we just have to get it right on offense. I don't know what that's going to look like. But I think we can probably give Buffalo a really hard time on defense. And we don't have a lot of good football on defense in the film room right now. So I think it's going to be um, I think it's going to be a good opportunity to get a big win. But again, we have to see how they play in Washington first. 
that's going to be the big test. I, I need to see the defense dominate here in order for me to feel confident about this team moving forward. But the offense, of course, we've talked about a bunch. That's what it's going to start with. But this defense needs to continue playing at a high level. We need to see four quarters now of, of this kind of game plan with this group playing at its best. Yeah, the defense turning around and playing better is going to make things easier for everybody because the offense, they're not going to have to be a lead for this team to win games. If the defense is great to elite level, then the offense is going to be okay being a little bit above average, and I think we're going to win football games. Like I said, the defense, they weren't perfect. They, I feel like their biggest problem, man, continues to be any kind of misdirection going on by the offense. The defense, they, they lose their mind. It's like they don't know how to play. So I'm going to take you through the Jets' biggest plays of this game, okay? So they have a 41-yard pass to Corey Davis. Eric Stokes bites on a double move, and that Ugh, was jet motion, first of all. I'm already having fun. We're one play in. <laughs> that was jet motion, first of all. Play action bootleg. Okay. Their second biggest play, 35-yard run for a touchdown. That was the first player of the fourth quarter. It was like an Andy Reid type of play where it was just really clever play design where they, they fake the pitch and then hand it off to the running back in the back door. Then you have a 20-yard run for a touchdown. That was the end around to Braxton Berrios. Then you have a 16-yard pass with jet motion and play action attached to it. A 14-yard pass with jet motion, play action. It was a backdoor tight end screen. It's like, man. Anytime the, the offense does anything creative, the defense, they just lose their minds. Thank God we don't have to play the Chiefs this year because the Chiefs are the best team at breaking out these types of plays. And whenever you do this against Joe Barry's defense, every player looks like they, they never played football before. But everything outside of those plays is good for the most part. The Jets finished 1 of 11 on third down. The defense was consistently getting off the field. They were covering really well. They were stopping the run for the most part for most of the game. Late in the game, they gave up a, a bunch of yards. But for the most part, they were getting the Jets off the field. But it continues to be these misdirection plays, the play-action plays, the fake jet motion plays. All of that just confuses the hell out of this defense. Yeah, Griff, I, I don't know what exactly they can do about that. Hopefully they just realize that they've got to be a little more sound on some of these, you know, because they're gonna teams are gonna try to confuse you. That's the point. Uh, I think Quay Walker needs to play a lot better because he's been just not good enough. That's one of the main problems too. You look at Brian Gutekunst and what he's done, trying to replace Devonte Adams or trying to compensate for that kind of loss, losing one of the best players in football. You know, drafting a linebacker in the first round and a defensive tackle who hasn't played much. I mean. It's It hasn't worked out to the way we would have liked so far. And I was all in on those picks. I, I love Quay Walker, the idea of, of a another linebacker next to Devondre. But Devondre hasn't played as well as he did last year. Quay Walker's not playing well enough. And Devontae Wyatt hasn't seen the field enough for my liking. So, um, And I, I think Devontae's great. I, I love Wyatt. And, and we saw how great he was in training camp. And we had a lot of high hopes for what he could do. But again, not on the field enough for us. So uh, just, I don't know. It's like we have to figure out what to do with, with the way that we've operated this offseason. We have to figure out a way to make it work. And the, the linebacker play's got to get better. The secondary is getting close, I think, to that elite level. And then up front, we got to continue to keep dominating. We have to uh, make a, a more consistent effort to really – let Rashawn Gary rip, and, and obviously Preston's going to continue to play well, and then keep jumbling it up with the interior next to Kenny Clark, and we should be good for the most part on the defensive side, but we have to continue to be aggressive and and utilize our talent because we don't have to be this afraid, scared, Joe Barry, Mike Pettin, terrified to let up a big play defense anymore. We can just be the talented group that we are and let that speak for itself and let our guys right. loose, and that's going to win us games. But we're just so scared. Is... We're so scared to, to let guys. We're just we don't realize how good we are. Almost, we're just so scared to let up big plays. I think we just need to let our guys play football and, and use their instincts. And I don't think we're going to allow many big plays. You talk about the linebackers. I feel like that's the biggest problem with these with all this misdirection stuff that I talked about. I feel like it all starts with the linebackers. Braun, you love the linebacker position. Why? It's my because favorite it's the heart defense. of the defense. It's the yeah. quarterback of the defense. They dictate everything. And I feel like they have not been good enough. Quay Walker, he's really not doing anything well. He looks lost in pass coverage a lot of the time. He's They keep blitzing him. And I'm all for that because of his speed and his athleticism. But he has not been effective as a blitzer whatsoever. If anyone's in his way, he gets stonewalled. I mean, go back and watch these blitzes. He's getting nowhere. He's not pressuring the quarterback. 
So it's like, what is he in? He, he doesn't defend the run well either. So it's like, what does he really do well? You know, and Devondre Campbell, I've been cutting in some slack early on in the season with the missed tackles. You know, week three, it's like, oh, he's already he's missed more tackles this season than he did all of last year. You know, it's crazy. But I'm, I'm thinking these are going to regress. This is just unlikely variance that all these missed tackles are happening, but they keep happening, and it's becoming a problem. It, it, it used to be like, this is too many missed tackles for Devondre Campbell's standards, but now it's becoming an actual problem where it's like, God, he's grab, grab, grabbing. Vince Lombardi, shout out. But he's grabbing. He needs to bring some guys <laughs> down, man. So the linebackers, I, said I think, you, do Griff, have to play I, better. I said to you at some point in the game uh, on Sunday, it just looks like he's grabbing with his hands. Like, he, he really is just using his hands to try to tackle as opposed to wrapping guys up. It's and Like you said, I think I actually said this to you literally at one point during the game. He's use, It's more grab, grab, grab and not wrap, wrap, wrap. Like, he's not wrapping these guys up. I think you actually stole that line from me, so thank you. No, you said something similar. You didn't You didn't say grab, 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 though. I'm pretty sure I, I pull did. out the Lombardi quote. Well, Lombardi said it in the 60s. Well, so. well, I guess we'll give Lombardi the total credit, and I'll fall back on that one. Devondre's supposed to be one of the best tacklers on this team, but he is just looking like He's supposed to be one of the himself. best tacklers in the league. Yeah, I mean, he missed four all of last year. He missed four tackles. Crazy. But yeah, you know, it makes sense why Joe Barry's getting creative with these packages of having Amos sub out Quay. So Amos is next to Devondre at linebacker, and we've got Rudy Ford at safety, who apparently the defense trusts, I think, for good reason. I think Rudy Ford's a good player. So I, I do like the, that package. They only broke it out, I think, four times during the game. But I do like Amos being next to Devondre because Quay Walker just... I don't think he. I don't think he's there yet. There's not a lot of optimism to have coming out of this game, but I, I do appreciate Joe Barry actually changing some things up, not being stubborn as a defensive play caller. I, I do have to appreciate that from him. Um, I think I think that's about it here. We've kind of gone through everything. Oh man, Braun, I can't believe we had to do this two weeks in a row now. Another Packers therapy session in the books. Packers are three and three. So Packers fans, I will leave you with this. Uh, in 2010, we all know what happened that year. The Packers did start, fun fact, 3-3. Three and three. They finished 10-6, and six, won the Super Bowl. Super Bowl XLV, Aaron Rodgers, the leader of that team. This year, obviously same story. We start 3-3. Three and three. Can they finish somewhere around 10-11 wins? That's going to be the key to making a wild card berth. That's the, or, or possibly winning the division if we can get past the Vikings, who are 5-1 and one right now, but... We can still do this. There's plenty of time. That's the good thing. We've only got three losses. We do have three wins. We are panicking like we are 0-10, but the good news is we've got time, and we can play better. There are definitely there are signs of life, and then they're quickly shut down. But if we could start to put this together, I do feel like there is certainly hope for greatness we are along on the fourth year of this ride of Matt LaFleur's Packers, fourth year of this podcast, and every year so far up until this season, we have felt that something special was coming. Right now, it's going to take quite the overhaul for that, but I do feel like it would be quite the story if we could come back from the way we're feeling and talking and every Packers fan is thinking right now to, to end up being something special in the end. For that reason, I would say keep the faith and stay strong. Let's go win in Washington next week, and let's come back and talk about a big win. I do find it funny about this fan base. You, you know the Packers are in a bad spot when people start talking about 2010, when people start comparing records from 2010. <laughs> It, you know that whenever more than two players go on IR at the same in the same week, People start bringing up 2010, too. <laughs> Griff, I'm trying uh, to keep our fans optimistic. I know, I know. You know, you're right, though. You're right. It's week six. It feels like the world is ending because the Packers just don't look like a good football team. But there is still time to turn it around. And like I said earlier, the other teams are not making us pay for this. It's not like the rest of the NFC is running away and we're at the 10 seed and it looks like we're never getting out of this hole. It's not. We're not quite there yet. We've got to make some changes, and there's still time to make those changes. It's going to take something like... Clay Matthews moving to middle linebacker in 2014. It's going to take something like that, like a big change. Maybe it's Elton moving back to guard and Yash being really good at right tackle. Maybe it's going to be something like that. Or maybe it's going to be a big sign. No, just kidding. But <laughs> it's going to take something that is going to galvanize the team, galvanize the fan base, and give us a reason for optimism. Because right now, there are not many reasons for optimism. There's just not. 
unless you're looking at records in 2010, you know. But there, there's really not much that we saw on Sunday that's going to give us a lot of hope, but there's still time for that to change. So Maybe it's Aaron, too. I mean, Aaron talked about he needs to take a little uptick in his play. What, maybe he goes to that level that, that, you know, he gets to that place where he's just locked absolutely in. You never know. So anything can do it. We just got to figure out what it is and then lean on it heavily and, and try to get some wins to get to a point where we feel good about uh, our record and, and we can get in at that point. It really, it is all about we've been through the 13 win seasons. We've done that three years in a row. It's it's time to start, you know, feeling good going into that thing about how we're playing. Like we can really win because we're so hot. Uh, it's all about what you do in the playoffs. We we like I said, we know what it's like to win in the regular season and we know that that really means nothing when it comes down to the playoffs. So, it doesn't matter how many wins we get as long as we get in that dance and maybe try it from a different approach instead of the bye, we go in there and win a wild card game and we get hot. That's all it's that's all it takes sometimes and and so this is going to be a different season, different type of approach. Let's just see how it goes and and enjoy the ride, enjoy the drama, you know, because if it all comes down to when we're playing well again, we're going to look back on this I would say very fondly. Yeah, we know better than any fan base, I'd say that losing as the number one seed at home doesn't feel any better than losing on the road as the number seven seed or six seed or five seed. So, yeah, you're right. You know what? Why do I even care about regular season games? That's going to do it. Stick around for our preview podcast coming out later this week. We'll be talking about the Washington Commanders, the Packers' first of a three-game road trip. They're going to Washington, D.C. to take on the Taylor Heineke Washington Commanders. So stick around for that. That'll come out probably Saturday. You can follow the podcast on Instagram at Today in Town. You can follow me on Instagram at All Day Packers, Braun on Instagram at Lambo.Leapers. Make sure to rate the star, rate the show five stars on iTunes and Spotify. Uh, give us your feedback. You can DM us on Instagram or you can leave a review on iTunes. And yes, so stick around, turn on notifications so you don't miss this preview podcast coming out later this week. And that will do it. <sighs> go Pack Go. Thank you for listening, everybody. And as always, go Pack Go. Go Pack Go.